While we all awaited big news on Monday when it came to the lockout, we got something completely different as the Miami Marlins announced that they will be mutually parting ways with CEO Derek Jeter. On today's show, I'm going to discuss not only how this impacts the Marlins, but also talk about how the Mets might have dodged a massive bullet when Alex Rodriguez failed to purchase the team. I just look at this Jeter situation as another example of how a star player does not transition easily into an executive role, and the Mets are in much better hands with Steve Cohen. I'll talk about all of that on this edition of Locked On Mets. <laughs> On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at FicklesteinRyan. You can also find some of my writing about the Mets at JustBaseball.com, where I am the managing editor. And I got to credit Just Baseball with some really good coverage today of the biggest story in the sport because nothing happened with the lockout, which we'll maybe get to a little bit at the end of the show today. But the big news today, unless a deal gets struck at the 11th hour as I'm recording this, 820 on Monday night. So at this point, don't expect that to happen. The big headline ends up being that Derek Jeter has stepped away from his role as the CEO of the Miami Marlins. And I want to really talk about this because for one, the Marlins are in the Mets division. So this does impact the Mets in that way. And just to go based on the fallout here, I don't think this is good for the Mets because I think they're in much more capable hands. The Marlins are under Kim Ang than they are with Derek Jeter calling the shots. And that's the thing that I I think so many people failed to realize when Derek Jeter bought the Marlins. I remember when this happened. I'm close to the situation. For those of you who don't know, I live in South Florida. So I have watched the Marlins up close my entire life. And the reaction when Jeter purchased Marlins was, you know, widespread praise because Jeffrey Loria and David Sampson were the Marlins version of, uh, you know, Fre- Fred and Jeff Wilpon. You know, Loria being the Fred of the situation, the owner, the the money man, and David Sampson being their version of Jeff Wilpon, the president, because he has connections to the owner. And with Sampson, it was his former father-in-law as opposed to Jeff Wilpon, where it was straight nepotism, but still. There was a lot of similarities there. And so when that ownership regime left and this huge name, Derek Jeter, comes into the fold, this was, you know, celebrated with so much praise. Marlins fans were thrilled. Media members were thrilled. Everyone thought that suddenly the Marlins would be on the right track. But I remember looking at the situation and saying, first off, the Marlins just sold for $1.2 billion. How are they worth that much? Because I've been to Marlins games my whole life, and particularly since they moved to Miami, that ballpark is never full. The revenue is always down. Interest is always down. So how do you expect to recoup any money on this investment in the short term? How are you not going to be burning a ton of capital? Then on top of that, it's announced that Derek Jeter was getting $5 million a year. So he had the greatest sweetheart deal in ownership history. He puts $25 million down to be the owner of the Marlins with Bruce Sherman. But he's the face. Everyone is taking Jeter as the principal owner, even though he was nothing close to that. He gets to run the team for five years, collect a $5 million salary, recoup all the money he invested, and then retain a stake in the team. And at the time, if you asked me, would Jeter be with the Marlins past the five years? I would have said no. Because let's look at history. I Just this idea that because Jeter had a great baseball IQ on the diamond, that that was going to translate to the front office was foolish. And it was based on his ego that he thought that he could be the end all be all. And he could just come in and make the Marlins a winner based on his will and determination. It just doesn't work like that. I mean, you look in the NBA, 
And Michael Jordan, the greatest of all time. How are the Hornets? Yeah, sure. They have some good pieces now. Maybe they're on a better track, but they've missed the playoffs more than they've made the playoffs since Jordan took over as the owner. And I mean, the franchise is, I'm sure, one of the least valuable in the sport. It's just not that simple. So when Alex Rodriguez was looking to buy the Mets, I was concerned because I didn't want to make in baseball decisions. And that's what Jeter's done with the Marlins. And granted, they are in a really good place right now. I'd argue maybe they are in a little bit of a better position now than when he took over, just in the fact that they have this rotation that's brimming with talent. But you go back to the team that he inherited, it had arguably the best outfield in baseball at the time, which Giancarlo Stanton, Christian Yelich, and Marcelo Zuna traded them all off, sparked this rebuild. And they've hit on some of those trades. You know, Sandy Alcantara, a very good piece of that rotation that came over in the Azuna trade. Uh, you know, they've had other additions that have worked out for them when it comes to some of these trades. You know, Jesus Lazardo was a big addition last season that they are really confident to be a big part of that rotation. Uh, Sixto Sanchez in the Real Muto trade. That rotation has been built from these trades, and maybe the Marlins are about to be on the cusp of a lot of winning. They made a lot of additions this offseason, adding Avisel Garcia in free agency, trading for Joey Wendell and Jacob Stallings. I look at them, and I think they're a sneaky team in the NL East this year. I wouldn't pick them to win it, but would I think that they could put together a better season than the Nationals? Absolutely. And I even think they could put together a better season than the Phillies if a couple things break right with their lineup and if their pitching lives up to expectations. Because also, a name I haven't mentioned is Trevor Rogers, their rookie from last year, who was just sensational. I mean, I think he probably should have got a little more consideration to be the rookie of the year, you know, award that Jonathan India ultimately won, and rightfully so. But that Marlins rotation is great, but they failed to develop hitting. And I really do encourage you to check out a couple of the articles we put out today for just baseball. One by Ethan Bukowski, um, where he just kind of outlined what had been happening in the news. And then the one I really want you to check out was written by RM Layton, our co-founder, who really did detail a lot of the behind the scenes moving parts here and how Kim Ang is definitely uh, the voice moving forward and how that's a good thing for this franchise, really, because Kim Ang has far more experience than Derek Jeter had. And there was a lot of people in the organization that had grown a bit sour of Jeter and Gary Dumbo, his right-hand man, who have been running operations. And so now you get a more established voice in Kim Ang that's going to take over. And, you know, that's probably bad for the Mets because, again, I think the Marlins are in better hands moving forward. But to me, this also just sparked something in my head where I thought, wow, the Mets really did dodge a bullet, didn't they? Because imagine where they would be right now if Alex Rodriguez and Jennifer Lopez, his ex-girlfriend or ex-fiance, had purchased the Mets, what position would this franchise be in? How much different would it be than it is right now, now that Steve Cohen has took over? I want to talk about that more in just a minute. Football might be over this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From the latest odd totals, player performance props, to where the next five coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season, and it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to your Olympic coverage and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in the action. BetOnline, where the game starts. So I want to take the time now to relate this Derek Jeter situation back to Alex Rodriguez because there was a fraction of the Mets fan base that was all in on A-Rod buying the team when it was still owned by the Will Ponds, and it appeared to be uh, you know, a rods team to lose at one point, you know, it seemed like they were the front runners to earn the bid to buy the Mets until Steve Cohen entered the fray again and blew out, you know, any other offers that were on the table. But a rod for a moment seemed to be the next owner of the Mets, or at least things were trending that way. And what always concerned me about that is we were hearing so much more about building up an entertainment um, you know, capital around city fields and Jennifer Lopez being able to bring in concerts and entertainment and, and all of these different things, how, how they had met with uh, Robert Kraft and they wanted to build a Patriots way, but for the Mets and all of that is fine and well. And, and hopefully 
there is some development around City Field. There's more things to do around the ballpark, and the fan experience can continue to grow over the years. But the difference between Alex Rodriguez and Steve Cohen is that, for one, Steve Cohen is fully committed to investing in the Mets payroll. And we have seen the addition of star players like Francisco Lindor, Starling Marte, and Max Scherzer in his first, whatever it is now, 18 months owning the team. That is significant to have added that much star power to see a future now that's going to be brimming with not only the stars that you develop with some of the you know upcoming prospects and Brett Beatty and Francisco Alvarez and Mark Vientos, but also that you can always accent the roster with a Max Scherzer. That is something that could not have happened, could not have been possible under Alex Rodriguez. But also, the other aspect of this is you don't have Alex Rodriguez atop your organization making baseball decisions, and that would have been the case. And to me, again, I prefer the experience. You can say what you want about Billy Epler and how, you know, for some he wasn't their top choice to take this position. I didn't have Billy Epler on my radar when the Mets were looking for a GM. But what we've seen since the Mets have made that hire is they have had an established, experienced executive atop their organization that has got things done, that went out and, and was able to land Mark Canna and Eduardo Escobar and also Starling Marte, all on reasonable contracts. Yes, they did overpay to land a Max Scherzer, but it still is a very significant thing that you got Scherzer to sign on the dotted line when he could have gone back to the Dodgers and probably made a pretty significant amount of money there as well. So it's not like he didn't have other opportunities to continue to go out and win. And he still did choose the Mets. They went out and they sat and they, you know, signed an established big league manager with experience. So I look at what the Mets have done and I just don't know where this franchise is. If Alex Rodriguez had taken over and the other problem that you get into when you have a group like the A-Rod group would have been where they were bringing in, you know, Travis Kelsey and all these different big name guys, but who were making small investments. And I believe it ended up being the Josh Harris and Blitzer group from the Sixers that was going to partner with A-Rod that maybe made things a little more possible because they had some of that money to be able to accomplish things. I'm actually getting a little bit confused with all the details because that was so long ago at this stage, but you compare the Met situation then with A-Rod potentially buying the team to what happened with the Marlins. And you see the problem in an ownership group coming in and not having the funds to properly run the team where you have to do everything you can just to meet an asking price. And then once you get the team, now you're left reeling. Now you're you're gutting your roster like the Marlins did, trading Stanton, trading Yelich, trading Ozuna, trading Real Muto, because you can't afford any of them and having to go into a lengthy rebuild as opposed to what the Mets have been able to do, which is rebuild their farm system under Steve Cohen. That's what they're trying to do while investing a ton of money in their payroll to win now. And I think if you want to get a really team-centric sense of what happened with the Marlins, I would check out Nothing Personal with David Sampson, the former president of the Marlins who I alluded to earlier. Sampson's really good when it comes to podcasting. Uh, he's a really entertaining voice that gives you a perspective that we don't often hear from, which is that of the former executive. And he's blunt and honest. And I know that that seems contradictory to his persona. No one really trusts a David Sampson. If you remember, he was in the news uh, because Steve Cohen put him out there at one point. Uh, I guess that was at the end of last season or maybe early in the off season. Uh, where he had, you know, thought that Samson was was trashing the Mets and in some capacity to the media. Um, regardless, David Samson, if you listen and pay attention to the content he's putting out, he is honest to a fault. He is honest about the sleazy things he did as the owner of the Marlins, which makes you, uh, you know, buy in a little more to everything he has been saying. And when it comes to the Marlins situation, he's pretty straight up and kind of takes a victory lap under the fact that. He sold that franchise for way more than it was worth. And you can't knock David Sampson as a businessman. You can knock him all you want as an executive because the Marlins were a disaster under his leadership. But he did two things with the Marlins that no one really expected him to be able to pull off. For one, he was able to get a stadium built in Miami with taxpayer dollars. Now, 
That is also why he's hated in South Florida, but it's still as far as a businessman's accomplishment, it was something that was an impressive feat. The second thing he did is he sold the Marlins for way above what they were worth. He sold them for $1.2 billion, and Samson has said they were probably worth like $700 million. So he got an extra half a billion dollars. And again, this is taking his word for it. But the way that he squeezed that money out of Jeter and the Bruce Sherman group is by setting the price there and making them believe that the biggest problem was David Sampson himself, that if it wasn't for him, the Marlins would be able to get a better TV deal and sell tickets and everything would work out just swimmingly. It didn't, and it hasn't. And the Marlins are going to continue to operate like a small market team. They're going to try to become the next Rays, and good luck doing that because so many teams have tried to accomplish what Tampa has and have failed to do so. But that will be the direction for the Marlins moving forward. They're never going to be – a $120 million payroll team in their best season. They might sniff close to $100 million in payroll, but right now they're projected at 55. Maybe they add one more significant free agent and get closer to $75 million in their payroll when it's all said and done. But it's a small market team. And the only way they're going to sell tickets is by winning games. So the Marlins are in a bad spot with their current ownership group. And it's going to be interesting to see how they can dig their way out of this and you know continue to be a sustainable franchise moving forward. And I don't think the situation would have necessarily gotten that dire under A-Rod, but it certainly would be a lot closer to that than where the Mets are currently standing with the richest owner in the sport, with technology that's going to be at the envy of every franchise in baseball. They're going to be able to develop their players better than ever before, and they're going to be able to continue to invest year after year. This is just another podcast of many where we are praising Steve Cohen's ownership of the Mets. But it's what you have to do at this point because this is beginning a much more exciting era of Mets baseball than what we've witnessed for the past 25 years. Anyway, I want to give you an update on the lockout, so we'll do that in just a minute. Now, I want to tell you about the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, which is Built Bar. Built Bars come low in calories. They're low in sugar but they are high in protein and they all come covered in 100% real chocolate, making it that perfect replacement for all of those sugary treats you might make part of your current diet that are just not healthy and good for you. And if you don't want the protein bars, they also have puffs, which are the first ever protein-infused marshmallows. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat and they're covered as well in 100% real chocolate with some incredible flavors like the yummy cinnamon churro, coconut marshmallow, or banana cream pie. So good. These have been some of my new favorite treats. If you want to try the puffs today or try some of the great Built Bar flavors like mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new, the white chocolate cookies and cream, you're going to want to go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built. Dot com. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure the often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing only the brand their warehouse happens to carry, when instead, you can go to rockauto.com yourself and save 30%, 50%, maybe even 100% more for the exact same parts from the chain store or car dealership. Rock Auto is a family business that's been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every customer. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Make sure you're right locked on in there. How would you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com thanks for making locked on Mets your first listen every day locked on mlb prospects host lindsey crosby is a prospect encyclopedia and he's going deep on the mlb stars of tomorrow it's free and available wherever you get podcasts all right so i will uh peruse twitter one more time and make sure that we do not have a deal that i am missing and at the moment i am not seeing anything uh, if you aren't john Heyman, the optimism is uh you know missing right now when it comes to this hope that a full season can take place john Heyman, 28 minutes ago which i guess is 
early, I guess around 8.15 on Monday night, uh, tweeted out that there seems to be some momentum now in MLB player talks. Nothing done and certainly no guarantee, but there's a bit more optimism at this hour. Bob Nightingale around the same time tweeted out that five negotiation uh, sessions are in the books this morning, this afternoon, and the evening, and still going. So the positive side here is that the two sides are talking. I wish they were talking for all the months leading up to when they finally got to the negotiating table over the last week here, but at least there's some progress being made. I don't think even at this stage, even with some of these building talks and maybe this push to, to meet a deadline that we see a deal done today. And I hope I'm wrong with that. I'm hoping that as I post this podcast, I'm going to have to post another one tomorrow morning, redacting everything I'm about to say because a deal comes in place. I don't think that's likely. It still seems like these sides have been a little bit too far apart to cover all of that ground in one day. And they're able to cover all that ground in one day. It's going to show you just how ridiculous this whole charade has been because we have seen the owners act like they are negotiating good faith. And I feel like the general public has seen through it because they haven't been coming down from their stances because they locked out the players in the first place because they set this deadline when what's really did the difference between you know, the an agreement being made on Monday as opposed to Tuesday. Does that one day of spring training really change things that significantly? It doesn't. It's their way to manufacture leverage because what they can do is they can prorate salaries again. And obviously that's going to cut into what every player makes and players don't want that. So that is their big leverage point. The players have a big leverage point in the fact that the owners want an expanded playoff with 14 teams. If the players agree to that they're going to want a better deal on their end and that is where things stand those are the two biggest leverage plays and then everything comes down really to the collecting the collect the collecting it what did i say collecting the collecting the collective bargaining threshold okay the luxury tax that's where uh, the two sides are farthest apart they have to get a lot closer the players want to see more spending from the owners they don't want to see uh, tanking be, you know, encouraged through, uh, you know, the draft picks situation. They want a draft lottery in place and they want teams to not be penalized for paying because they would like Steve Cohen to be able to freely spread that money out as much as he would like to and uh, give a lot of sweetheart contracts with the one that Max Scherzer just signed. We'll see what happens here. That's going to be the biggest thing that Mets fans have to look at when this new CBA is ratified is to see what those penalties are because it's really going to impact what Cohen is able to do with this Mets team. But when it comes to a timeline, everything is so uncertain right now that I'd be lying if I gave you any real indication. But what I can tell you is my gut says we still get 140 games this year. Maybe this stretches out a couple of weeks. I think a really nice landing spot would be 154 games if this is able to be amended by the end of this week because 154 games was the previous amount that Major League Baseball played. So there is historical precedence. And I also think in general, we could go back to 154 games anyway. And I feel like that would be a really you know happy medium where, yes, the owners can still have a ton of games to sell to their television partners and to sell and, and get, you know, the gate for, but you could really, uh, you know, help the, the, uh, you know, travel for players, the time off with that extra wiggle room of eight games taken off the schedule. So maybe 154 games get played this year. And who knows, maybe that's something that major league baseball considers moving forward. If not though, it would be a, a great landing spot. I think it'd be a, an incredible, um, resolution to all this if we were able to get that many games. But I'm still optimistic that we're going to see over 100 games, that the season is not going to be cut significantly. The owners were threatening to cut a month of play. Hopefully it's more like two weeks. And uh, these sides can come to terms soon where we will then get a free agent frenzy leading into a shortened spring training and then hopefully a opening day at some point in April. Regardless, so that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. I will keep you posted on tomorrow's show if anything changes when it comes to the lockout. Otherwise, we will continue our series setting expectations 
four Mets players. And next on my list is Eduardo Escobar and Mark Canna. They were added the same day, so we will discuss them together on tomorrow's show. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On MLB, hosted by Paul Francis Sullivan. Locked On MLB is where you want to go to learn about both the past and the present for Major League Baseball. Call him Sully and tune in to Locked On MLB wherever you get podcasts.